Beatrice Chestnut, welcome to the new school at Commonweal. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Michael. It's an honor to be here. It's such a delight to have you here, Beatrice. I um, find your book, uh, The Complete Enneagram, 27 Paths to Greater Self-Knowledge, and your new book on leadership, uh, to be two of the really remarkable uh, uh, presentations of a very great tradition. And um, so I'm very honored that you've been willing to come and do four hours of workshop with us and conversation. Um, you are a psychotherapist, a coach, a, um, a consultant to businesses and individuals. Uh, you've been working with Enneagram for how many years now? 28 years. 28 years. And we will get into uh, the detail of all of that, which is completely fascinating. Uh, you worked with Claudio Naranjo, uh, one of the, the great uh, seminal figures in the field, uh, uh, and uh, with many others. Um, so uh, I guess where I'd like to start before you do your presentation is um, just to ask you to Describe briefly where you find yourself in this work after 28 years of doing it. Where are you as we sit here today mm. uh, in, uh, in your self-exploration and what purpose you seek to serve in dedicating your life to the Enneagram? Mm. Uh, what a beautiful place to start. Um, I think... Uh, where I find myself now is um, how to find ways to use the Enneagram to uh, continue to deepen my own personal journey, my own personal self-work, and also find better ways to help others um, to do the same. I think the beautiful thing about the Enneagram is it's its insights, the work you can do with it is never ending. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it certainly lasts a lifetime. Um, and for me, uh, it's been invaluable and I'm, I use it every day, you know, in terms of being aware of, uh, what I need to be aware of, um, to be a more self-aware person, a more healthy person. So on the one hand, um, I'm continuing to use it to guide my own work, um, and always sort of be, uh, making efforts to be aware. One of my uh, mentors and teachers uh, used to say, self-remembering never becomes habitual. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a continual practice of remembering myself and uh, trying to be more self-aware. And then in addition to that, um, trying to find ways to partner with others, uh, to continue to write, to continue to create opportunities for people to come to the Enneagram work, um, mm -hmm. to make it accessible to people, uh, to make it interesting and enjoyable, but also uh, more and more um, working with uh, my business partner and my co-teacher, Uranio Pais, um, shifting from kind of using the Enneagram in sort of a kind and gentle way, which is, I think, very much to um, uh, encourage compassion and empathy for yourself and others, but also to use it more and more also to confront the ego. Uh, because I think especially today in the world, um, part of the crisis that we're facing or the crises we're facing, I, I believe, comes from too, being too lost in the needs of the ego, of the personal ego. Uh, and the Enneagram, I think, is an invaluable tool because what it teaches us is the more aware we are of our ego needs, of the functioning of our ego or our personality, the more we can see what it's doing and uh, move away from its self-limiting patterns that can keep us too narrowly focused on our self-image, on fear, on getting our needs met, on survival, uh, and broaden our focus uh, to the people around us, uh, to what's good not only for ourselves, but for other people, uh, because I think uh, we're more than the sum of our parts when we come together in community. And so understanding ourselves at a deeper level and the way our egos can drive the show, 
uh, creating more room for self-reflection allows for us to make different choices, more conscious choices, have empathy for others, uh, for people we may not understand at first. Uh, and and uh, in, in my view, uh, this is an important project for uh, shifting things and making things better for everyone. Mm. I love your focus on uh, confronting the ego and the personality. As, as you say in the complete Enneagram, uh, many people are completely identified with their personality. That's, they think that's who they are. Right. But in fact, uh, the ancient traditions teach us that, uh, and Gurdjieff, the Russian mystic who brought the Enneagram to the West, uh, teaches us... Uh, that in fact we're much more than the personality and that, uh, or the ego, and that uh, we are in fact in a kind of waking sleep, that it's possible to wake up, right. and that the Enneagram is a great tool for that. <laughs> exactly. But as you point out, uh, you don't see it, and many other teachers have not seen it as a standalone tool. Right. And you teach it from the perspective of an immersion in a, a wide variety of fields. Uh, so that it's a tremendously useful, but you teach it, uh, as many others have, as, uh, as part of a deeper uh, set of approaches to self-awareness. I mean, you go back, uh, I, I gave a talk the other day on the Bhagavad Gita, and in fact, the Gita is uh, a deep teaching on, um, on uh, confronting the ego, in right. a certain sense. Uh, and when when Krishna presents himself to Arjuna in all his glory, that's the true self, you know. And, right. and you know, there's the, the, uh, there's the, uh, the individual spark of the true self that's within us, and then there's the divine self. And so the Enneagram itself can be seen as, uh, as nine approaches, uh, nine faces of the divine in a, in a deep sense. So one of the other points that you make on your blog online is that, on your excellent website, uh, is that um, uh, you caution against people who use the Enneagram as a kind of parlor trick or, a, uh, or teach it lightly or write books about it without a deep sense of its sacredness and its seriousness of purpose. Right. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I think the Enneagram is a powerful tool, and because of that, we need to treat it with great care. Right. Uh, I think uh, in order, the, the, neat, the thing I like about the Enneagram, one of the many things, is that you can talk about it in purely psychological language, you can talk about it in purely spiritual language, you can talk about it in both at the same time, mm -hmm. or neither. Mm -hmm. You can talk about it in simply practical terms as when I go into businesses and work mm -hmm. with them. Um, but if you're going to teach the Enneagram, mm -hmm. if you're going to use it as a tool, not just for your own personal development, but with others, uh, I think it's really important to bring a greater expertise to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you necessarily need training and education mm -hmm. in either psychology or spirituality or organization development or something like that because mm -hmm. it is such a powerful tool. It almost needs to be used in context of an understanding of what it takes to, mm -hmm. uh, to develop and, ha and how a tool like this is best used. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that I was going to mention later, but I'll mention it now because it's, I'm fascinated. The, the Enneagram has um, gotten quite a lot of reach in sort of the uh, counterculture, new age community. It's gotten a lot of reach in divinity schools. It's gotten quite a lot of reach in um, organizational development. But, and tell me if I'm wrong about this. It seems to me that it has never gotten the respect I believe it deserves in the uh, community of archetypal psychology. In other words, why is it that the Jungians, the uh, post-Jungians, James Hillman, uh, many people who I have tremendous respect for, um, um, why is it that uh, Asajolian psychosynthesis why is it that those traditions have found their way into what I regard as a higher level of cultural credibility 
than the Enneagram. Now, I have thoughts about that, but I'm curious, number one, do you share my assumption that that's true? And number two, do you have ideas about why that's true? Yes, I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that is true. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, both in mainstream psychology and sort of what you're talking about, archetypal astrology, I think that's true. More surprising in the world mm-hmm. of archetypal psychology mm-hmm. or what we might even call transpersonal psychology, right. which I think psychosynthesis would be a part of mm-hmm. that. Um, and I, I think it's interesting. I think there may be an academic bias where it need, you need to be based on something. You know, mm-hmm. I think, for instance, the MBTI has gotten far not only because they created a, a good test, mm-hmm. but because it was based on Jungian thinking. Mm-hmm. And Jungian is such a solid foundation, a, a good source, a, a very credible Um <laughs> Not not everyone understands that the Enneagram also isn't completely aligned uh, with a lot of uh, the, you know, foundational ideas in psychology. I wrote a, a paper several years ago um, integrating object relations theory with the Enneagram. Mm-hmm. Um, but, of course, no one read it because who's going to read that? <laughs> you know, the, the psychologists sort of aren't interested because the Enneagram seems a little bit odd or strange or out there. Um, and some, and it was a little bit too academic for some of the Enneagram audience. So I think it's – I have found that some of, my, some of my psychotherapist friends have gotten very into the Enneagram, usually because of our personal connection. But when I've tried to introduce it a little bit outside my personal circle, it doesn't really – catch on and I'm not exactly sure why that is my 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 hunch my guess is that it is uh, people get really kind of <coughs> entrenched in their way of seeing or their theory or what they think works for them and it works for them so it's almost like there's a, a lack of openness to considering this even though there's a way I mean I think of the Enneagram as a grand theory in psycho- psychological theory mm-hmm. in that if, if you understand the Enneagram, you can see how all these different theories either fit inside it or are aligned with it or um, overlap with it in significant ways. Yeah. My, my theory about the lack of respect, because the reason the lack of respect fascinates me is that, you know, I've studied depth psychology for 50 years, and, and really it's one of my primary interests. And, you know, I personally regard... Jung as the great figure, even more than Freud, uh, in um, in modern psychology. Uh, you know, uh, William James, an incredible figure, and so on. But um, I think that some of the reasons that Enneagram may not have gotten the respect it deserves has to do with its provenance. I think that coming from a controversial Russian, Russian mystic Gurdjieff mm-hmm. uh, uh, representing a very ancient system. But then the modern movement coming out of Oscar Chazo and Claudio Naranjo, both of whom come from Latin America. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that had they come from England, had they come from Europe, mm. Uh, it would have been different, but there, I think there actually is a kind of a prejudice that nothing of the highest caliber in psychology could possibly come out of Latin America, which is fascinating because if you read Naranjo, his range of cultural reference is actually greater oh, yeah. by a long stretch right. than most of the people who critique him in the United States. And we forget that Latin American intellectuals and intelligentsia have this deep relationship with European thought. Right. And therefore, they have this frame of reference that actually exceeds the richness of American frame of reference. You know, mm-hmm. So it just fascinates me because in... Of all the depth psychologies that I've studied, Enneagram, to me, has the most powerful explanatory capacity. Right. You know. Right, right. I think you're, I think you have a, make a great point, and you are probably right. My teaching partner is from Brazil, Mm -hmm. uh, and he often says that there's a kind of underdog quality to people from Latin America, and so I think that could, very well could be an important element. I think another element may be in the early years of the Enneagram movement, 
Um, of course, um, both Echazo and Naranjo in the early years didn't want it to get out. They wanted it to be they secret. They wanted it to be secret. And so their intention was very much to keep it within a small closed community. Uh, now it leaked out from Naranjo's community in, the, in, in Berkeley um, to a few other people <laughs> who then shared it with other people who ended mm -hmm. up writing a couple of the first, some of the first books about mm -hmm. it. Um, and I'm trained as an academic and part of my internal frustration with the Enneagram and the way that the literature has come out mm -hmm. has been that it isn't, it hasn't followed a kind of academic trajectory. Mm. Uh, it isn't, the books that were written weren't firmly based on the foundation of Naranjo and Echazo mm. uh, in a way. And so it's almost as if people wrote books about it that were a little bit more just descriptions of the personalities mm -hmm. uh, and not tethered to the deeper theory, which of course is very rich. Uh, and especially Naranjo um, wrote about so much because like you say he he understood so much about spirituality about Gurdjieff's fourth way about psychiatry psychology um, literature philosophy the human potential movement the human potential movement yeah. you know he, was, he worked with Fritz Perl it's with Fritz Perl's uh, in, in mm -hmm. Gestalt at Esalen um, and so I think what happened is because there was this break the people who wrote the first books we're not writing with Claudio's blessing, or in some ways in homage or in term basing their work on his seminal work. Mm -hmm. I think it be, it sort of like it became more of a popular uh, movement than something that was attached to or tethered to its deeper roots. And I think is it fair to say that your book, The Complete Enneagram: Twenty Seven Paths to Greater Self Knowledge is the first comprehensive book to be deeply based on Naranjo's teaching and Echazo. That was certainly my intention. Yeah, I think that's true. I think it shines through. Great. Uh, just this deep sense uh, that from all the fine people who have interpreted Enneagram, right. you go back to Echazo and especially Naranjo right. and, and really base your work deeply on his teaching. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Well, that's a good place to uh, stop the introductory piece and ask you to give us uh, an overview of Enneagram. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you yeah. Um, for that very thorough introduction. So um, I, my intention is to give kind of an overview of uh, how I came to the Enneagram, um, a little bit about what the Enneagram is and its ancient roots. Uh, and how the Enneagram works to bring about healing and transformation. I think that's the most important topic uh, and what my work with the Enneagram is right now, just ending with that. Um, so I, I know that the, the people in the room and the people in the audience may know something about the Enneagram, so I am assuming a bit of knowledge. I'm, I'm not starting from the beginning and doing the basics, uh, but I trust we can uh, follow up. Uh, as needed, uh, either with uh, the book or in the conversation or with greater learning. So I learned the Enneagram in 1990 um, from a friend's dad. Um, I was uh, a very dear friend of mine from junior high on was uh, David Daniels, who is the son of David Daniels, the Enneag early Enneagram teacher and pioneering uh, teacher. Uh, David Daniels was, uh, if you don't know him, he um, formed one of the first Enneagram schools with Helen Palmer. So it was an interesting partnership because, of course, Helen Palmer wrote one of the first popular books on the Enneagram, uh, and that was the first book I read. Um, and she connected up with Dr. Daniels, who was a psychiatrist based at Stanford. So this was an, an and of course, Helen, although she certainly uh, doesn't advertise this uh, uh, at the top of her resume, uh, is an intu worked as an intuitive for many years. Um, so in part, she came to the Enneagram because of the Berkeley community around Naranjo, but also because of her interest in intuition and what gets in the way of us being in contact with our intuition, which turns out to be the personality and our habits connected to our personality. So um, I met Dr. Daniels because I was good friends with his son, and his son died in 1990, and so I had occasion to be around his family um, in an intensive way, 
And one night at dinner, <laughs> it was my turn to be taught about the Enneagram. So one night at dinner, having, having spending a lot of time with the Daniels family after uh, their son's death, um, which was, uh, of course, a huge tragedy. Um, Dr. Daniels, they wanted to have his friends around. And one night it was my turn. And so Dr. Daniels uh, turned to me and said, so I think you're a two on the Enneagram and here's a book. <laughs> so I took Helen's book home and I read all about it and it absolutely blew my mind. Um, it was just stunning to me that I'd never really been interested in psychology at all. Um, it was the one class I always joke, it was well, the one class in undergraduate, in my undergraduate career at UCLA that I got a C in uh, was psychology. <laughs> um, and I always thought it was just like giving sort of jargony names to things that seemed really obvious. Um, and so I wasn't really interested until I came upon the Enneagram and I was just amazed that there was something that could describe me to myself in such detail that was so thorough and deep. Uh, and so it not only, I think, really uh, helped me understand myself, but it redirected the course of my career, uh, reconnected me with a sense of spirituality. Um, and there was just something about it that made me sort of believe in something, that there was some deeper reality that I wasn't in touch with. Um, so I, uh, because of my connection with Dr. Daniels, um, I went through the training program that he and Helen Palmer created and became certified in 1997. Um, as soon as I finished my dissertation, um, which was on, uh, I, I got a, P I was getting a PhD at the time in communication studies, uh, and I studied mass media and politics. And my dissertation was on Iran Contra and why Bush and uh, and Reagan could have been uh, prosecuted for crimes, but weren't, uh, and how they framed the news to make it so they didn't uh, seem guilty. Uh, and I finished that in 1996, and I went right back to school to become a therapist. Uh, and I went to the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, uh, became a therapist. And the, what was interesting about my psychological education was that I, from the moment I started that, I had known the Enneagram for about six years. Um, so I went into studying psycho Western psychology with the Enneagram in my head. Um, so when I everything I learned as I was going through all the different theories you learn, I immediately could see how it was related to the Enneagram. Uh, and in my transpersonal psychology class, I wrote a 50-page paper about the Enneagram and how it's the ideal uh, transpersonal tool. Um, of course, not very many people were into the Enneagram then, but, um, but it was um, definitely something that shaped not only my education and my understanding of psychology, but also the way I worked with clients. So when I first started working with clients, of course, it's really hard to be a new therapist because you know, people are coming to you for help and you uh, don't really know what you're doing. Um, and I used to think about my fellow students and I'd think like, how are you doing this without the Enneagram? Uh, because to me, the Enneagram gave me a very quick uh, way to understand what's the issue with this person and what do they need. Um, I, uh, after, after I became a therapist, uh, I, in 2000, started going to international Enneagram conferences and so became part of the international Enneagram community. I was on the international board of directors of the International Enneagram Association for six years, from 2004 to 2009. Um, I was president from 2006 to 2007. Um, and in 2004, a big thing happened, and that is we invited Claudio Naranjo to come to the IEA conference, the annual conference in Washington, D.C. Now, this was a big event because uh, Naranjo had been basically alienated from the mainstream or the, at least most of the US-based Enneagram community uh, for many years because he was still mad about the way it leaked out from his original group in the 70s uh, and how people were writing books about it. He saw those books as not really what they should be. Uh, and so mostly was teaching in Latin America, Central America, and Europe. Um, but he came back in 2004 and he brought 15 of his associates, which are some of the highest caliber gestalt therapists, psychodrama therapists around in the world. Uh, and he taught a three morning uh, workshop on the subtypes. Um, and the subtypes uh, are the three versions of each of the nine types based on which of three instincts is most 
uh, prominent in your experience. I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. But basically, you can have a dominant self-preservation survival instinct or a dominant social instinct about getting along with the herd or the group or a dominant one-to-one -one or sexual instinct about bonding with specific others. Um, and this was a an aspect of the Enneagram system that I had heard about since the early my early training, but one I would ne I was never very interested in because I thought it was rather vague. Uh, it didn't really tell me very much. I couldn't figure out which subtype I was, and it didn't seem very helpful. Um, so I had mainly ignored it until Naranjo came, and he described the 27 subtypes, the three versions of each of the nine types, in a way I had never heard before. Um, he and his associates helped me understand that I was a self-preservation too and what that meant. And it was like a whole new world. It was, it was as shocking and uh, life-changing as finding my type in 1990. Um, it, it was like a whole world opened up uh, at, underneath what I was doing with the Enneagram uh, and that I learned uh, that I was repressing a lot of fear. I learned what it meant to be self-preservation dominant and that... Uh, added a whole uh, new level to my own personal work in therapy. I brought, I brought it to my therapist and said, hey, I found out I'm really afraid. Uh, and he said, yeah, finally you figured that out. I've been noticing you're really anxious ever since I met you. Uh, when I come to get you in the waiting room, you seem terrified. Uh, and so that was a big, significant personal uh, revelation for me. And after that conference, interestingly, um, everyone acted like it hadn't happened. Um, and again, I think this is partly due to sort of this breach between Naranjo and the rest of the community uh, and the ongoing uh, tension that existed there. Uh, and I also think, you know, people were already teaching the subtypes the way they were, and they weren't necessarily open to this new piece of information. But I went on a mission uh, to learn everything I could about what Naranjo was teaching relative to the subtypes because I thought it clarified the system, it deepened the system, uh, it expanded its range in, in, a, in a really important way. So right, wanting to bring more of Naranjo's, what I call modern wisdom about the, Enne uh, the Enneagram subtypes out into the world motivated a lot uh, my, uh, my wanting to write a book about the Enneagram. Um, I, I felt pretty shy about this because it's like, what do I know? There's already these books out there that are really popular, everyone likes. And I heard people say when my book did come out, like, I didn't think we needed another Enneagram book. Um, but but uh, she said, but this is a good one. But um, there were two reasons I wanted to write a book. One was to bring the Naranjo subtypes out to more people. And the other one was I had been working with the Enneagram as a psychotherapist for a while. Um, and I was finding it so valuable and I was learning so much that I wanted there to be a book that was written by a practicing psychotherapist uh, that really helped people understand the psychology behind the Enneagram uh, or, or within the Enneagram in a way that was accessible. So I wanted to bring insights, uh, psychological insights relative to the Enneagram to more people. So I wanted to write a book that, that was easy to read, maybe even fun to read, but that also was connected to the tradition, connected to what Naranjo had said, the seminal authors, uh, and brought that forward in a way that was both really true to the tradition and what the Enneagram um, can be, uh, but also uh, 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 of, of great depth in a way that people could connect with. Um, and then I wrote The Nine Types of Leadership in 2017 in response to uh, an agent calling me up and said, saying, I think there, we, there's a good opening for an Enneagram book for business. And I, I took the opportunity in that book. I had had to give up a little bit when I wrote The Complete Enneagram, the goal of wanting to write, to, to reach out to people who didn't know anything about the Enneagram, a more introductory book. The Complete Enneagram ended up being a little bit um, sophisticated um, for the, uh, you know, the total beginner. Uh, so the nine types of leadership was not only to help leaders understand themselves and workplace relationships, uh, but also to kind of go a little bit more to the introductory level and invite people into the system that might be brand new to it. So what is, in the, what is the Enneagram? It is, uh, and, and this is some of what Gurdjieff said, it's a symbol of perpetual motion. Uh, it's a framework for a personality typology with nine types. 
uh, and uh, three versions of each type, 27 subtypes. Uh, it's a powerful, powerful tool for uh, increasing self-awareness, first and foremost, uh, but also understanding others and increasing emotional intelligence, which is basically self-awareness plus uh, empathy for others and social awareness. Um, and it's also a process map. It's a map of process. So not only are these, dis these numbers distinct points that represent uh, personality archetypes, uh, but it's also a map of movement. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So what Gurdjieff said is that uh, you can't really understand the Enneagram without seeing it as in motion. Uh, so in order to be understood, uh, the Enneagram needs to be thought of as in motion. A fixed Enneagram symbol is a dead symbol. So um, sometimes you'll see Enneagrams symbols without the arrow lines. Um, I always feel a little bit uncomfortable when I see that because the arrow lines remind us that we need to be seeing it as in motion. Um, not only is the Enneagram uh, it's something that should be seen in motion, but it's also three-dimensional. And so this this two-dimensional drawing doesn't really give you the full effect. It's actually, the circle is actually a sphere, uh, and when we move up and down it, we actually are moving in a spiral around the sphere, uh, and the, any, the, the triangle in the middle is really the Merkaba. It's really a, uh, a pier two pyramids, one going up and one going down, um, that is a lot about, that has a deep symbolic meaning. I won't go into too much more than that now, but just to give you a sense that there is so much more to the Enneagram than, than is often understood when we see the basic two-dimensional diagram. So Gurdjieff said, um, and Gurdjieff, of course, as uh, Michael mentioned, was an Armenian mystic uh, who lived in the first part of the 20th century uh, and was the way, one of the principal ways that we learned about the Enneagram symbol uh, and its meaning and its connection to mystical, spiritual traditions. Um, he did not talk about the nine types. He did talk about each different people having chief features um, and he did, which will turn out to match up with some Enneagram type uh, information. And he also talked about types generally, but he mainly focused on three types. Uh, he called it man number one, man number two, and man number three. And these were people who used, who came from the three different centers of intelligence. So someone who is a more body-based person is man number one. Someone who is a more heart-based person is man number two. And someone who is a more head-based person is, is man number three. So we talked about these three types. And he talked about chief features. But even more than that, he told us about um, the deep, powerful, symbolic meaning of the symbol. Um, he basically said that, that we tend to think of our moment in, in time or in history uh, as the the, the forefront, like the, the farthest moment in, of progress of the human condition, right? But what he said is actually in the distant past, they actually knew more than we know now uh, in some ways. And so there were secret schools of people who had figured out a lot of the secrets of the universe uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of years ago. And these people um, needed a way to convey to future generations some of these secrets they discovered. Uh, and so they created symbols. They encoded their, the knowledge, the, the, the wisdom that they developed in symbols because they knew, <clears throat> they knew that language was untrustworthy as a conveyor of information over eras of time because the human ego can uh, get in the way and... Uh, transform the meaning of language. He said that the Enneagram is the philosopher's stone of the alchemists. He said it's a symbol of unity and multiplicity. And uh, he said that if you know how to read the Enneagram, it makes books and libraries entirely unnecessary, uh, which is, of course, a big statement. And I also think it, it, it should make us very humble uh, about our ability to really interpret uh, all the uh, wisdom that the Enneagram conveys. And I think we are at the very beginning of rediscovering uh, all that's encoded in the Enneagram. So the Enneagram is a, um, it, it, we, I don't have 
time to go into this, but I'll just mention it. Uh, it's, symbol of, it's a symbol of unity and multiplicity in that, of course, we understand there are, of course, millions of unique individual people in the world. However, there are also patterns that we share. Uh, and so sometimes when people first learn the Enneagram, they think, how could there only be nine types when there are so many people? Uh, and it's based on this idea that there are, pat there are naturally occurring patterns in nature uh, that we see in the shapes and the order of the universe in everything from galaxies to the shell of a snail to a flower uh, to all of these things. Uh, and that these things, according to Gurdjieff, could be described uh, by various laws. And the Enneagram is a combination of three basic laws, the law of one, which is uh, conveyed by the circle, the idea that everything is connected. Uh, the law of three, which is this, the inner triangle of the Enneagram communicates this. And this is the, the law of three is sometimes called the law of creation. And it's the idea that it takes three forces for anything to come to be created in the world. Uh, and the law of seven, which is uh, signified by the periodic figure, the other lines. And the law of seven is about sequence, about the way uh, events unfold in a series of seven steps. Uh, and you can see this in the musical scale or octave. So the Enneagram is, uh, I, when I teach the Enneagram, especially in businesses or to new, when, if, when I'm teaching it to people for the first time, I like to start with the centers of intelligence. The idea that the Enneagram is based on this idea, not that we have one center of intelligence. In the West, we tend to think of it as our head, uh, but really on three centers of intelligence. Uh, and this is the body, the heart, and the mind. So each of these is a center of intelligence, a way that we process information from the outside world. Um, within these, and the, the idea is, is that humans, when we're in personality, we're out of balance. And that is we tend to use one center more than the other two. So there are three types, three personality types that overuse the body center three types that overuse the heart center, and three types that overuse or live more from the head center. Uh, and of course, part of working with the Enneagram and using it as a tool for transformation is understanding how you use that center and how you're coming from that center uh, over much so that you can balance it out by developing your access to the other two centers. Now within each center, there are three types. And each of us will tend to favor or come from or identify with or play out the patterns of one of those three types. So you can already see the effect of the law of three. Uh, everything in the Enneagram comes in threes. Um, and then, uh, although while you identify with one type, like I'm a two, so I'm in the heart center and I'm, I identify with type two and I uh, when I learned the Enneagram, I could see that I was very much acting out the patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving of the type 2 personality. Uh, there's another level of it, which is the subtype level. Um, and this is based on which of one of three instincts is most dominant. So we tend to favor one center. Within that center, we tend to identify with one type. And then within that type, we tend to uh, overuse... Uh, one instinct of these three instincts, self-preservation, social, or sexual, uh, we tend to overuse that as we uh, try to survive in the world. Uh, and uh, not only do we overuse one of those three instincts, but we underuse another one. Um, we, and this is something that uh, I started, to, this is the idea, the teaching around the instincts uh, is something I started uh, developing and uh, based on the subtype information I had gotten from Naranjo in 2004. Uh, but much of it also comes from my teaching partner, Uranio Pius, who I uh, am increasingly partnering with in the way that I um, do workshops with the Enneagram. Um, and he has a deep, did, has done it many multi-year deep study in the Gurdjieff work and also in the Sufi tradition. So some of what I'm saying about the instincts comes from him. Um, and we not only one instinct tends to dominate our experience and the instincts are very fast, they're connected to the reptilian brain and they're based in the belly center, uh, but we also tend to repress one of our instincts. We tend to not use it as much. Uh, and then there's usually one that's kind of in the middle that we use sort of more in normal range. So uh, having a dominant instinct simply means that 
Um, if I'm a self-preservation type, I think my preservation is threatened much more than it is, right? Because my personality, part of what happens with the instinct, the instinct is our animal wisdom, which is a good thing. Um, however, when, it's, when, when the lower emotional center of the personality gets involved, it directs the instincts. So the problem occurs when the instincts get uh, integrated into the functioning of the personality and we overuse one instinct. And so it drives us in certain ways, um, uh, in habitual ways that we often don't see, uh, to over, for, as me, for a self-preservation, overemphasize my preservation and, uh, and not realize that my life isn't threatened as much as I think. Uh, I don't really have to be thinking about what I'm having for dinner when I'm eating breakfast. Uh, that sort of, I'll be okay. I'm not going to starve. It's that kind of thing. So um, I usually don't use the names of the types. Um, I didn't use them in my books. Um, but sometimes when uh, I'm introducing it, I tend to use them only because it gives people some information to hang their new knowledge on. Um, so nine is called the peacemaker or the mediator. One is sometimes called the perfectionist or the reformer. But interestingly, there's one subtype of one that's really the perfectionist, and there's another subtype of one that's really the reformer. So you can already see how these names, uh, the names of the types can be a little bit of a blunt instrument, a little bit crude. Um, two is uh, sometimes called the helper or the giver. I've renamed it the befriender because I think uh, there's too much emphasis on helping and giving when it comes to twos and not as much information about the dark side behind that. Um, threes, achiever, performer, fours, individualist, sometimes artist, five is the investigator or the observer, six is the contrarian or the devil's advocate, seven, the enthusiast, and, and eight, the challenger. And it's interesting to know one of Naranjo's insights was that each type is actually kind of a combination of the types on either side of it. Um, there's a lot that has to do with um, sort of the asymmetry of the Enneagram, things on certain that uh, th uh, traits that uh, uh, types on one side have uh, versus the other side on the bottom, the top. So there's just a lot in it uh, that I won't go into right now, but those are the types. Um, there's the inner triangle of the Enneagram. I mentioned in the introduction that I had done a um, paper uh, sort of integrating the Enneagram and object relations theory. And there are a lot of three stage theories about human development that map perfectly onto the inner triangle of the Enneagram. Um, in this case, uh, you see that it's, it, it also maps perfectly along with the three Buddhist poisons. And Naranjo makes this uh, point that uh, these three uh, sort of focuses are important uh, and they're sort of foundational in that they are associated with the points on the core points of the inner triangle, but the types on either side of each of these also share these uh, traits. So ignorance being uh, a Buddhist word for the idea that we all fall asleep, the idea that humankind is asleep. And again, nines, uh, type nines have that as a central feature. They tend to go to sleep to themselves and have a hard time acting on their own behalf. Uh, but this is something that all of us share, that all humans uh, are kind of in a waking sleep. We all tend to go to sleep to our experience. Uh, and so that's a foundational idea. Um, aversion or fear at, type, at, the, at the six point. Uh, fear is something all humans share. We all are motivated by fear in some ways uh, to defend ourselves. And the Enneagram personality types are uh, foundationally, they are a mode of defense adopted in childhood. They're adaptations uh, that were adopted uh, in perceived emergency situations uh, when we were young children uh, to adapt to our environment and to stay safe and to survive. Uh, so fear is the core of the type six and five and seven their personalities are shaped also in response to childhood fear. And then at the three point, we have craving in the Buddhist system, uh, but also vanity uh, in terms of the, a, a sort of 
identifying with a personality and becoming inauthentic that the three heart types share, two, three, and four. Also, I think it's important to say that the core emotions uh, are also here and that the core emotion associated with the heart types is sadness. There's a kind of sadness that grows up around uh, heart types often got the message in childhood that they needed to be something other than they were to get love and appreciation. Uh, and so they uh, create an image uh, to get the love and appreciation or approval from the outside world. But there's a longing for love, which is related to this idea of craving. Uh, there's a longing for, I never really got the love that I wanted for who I really essentially am, uh, that is at the core, uh, that creates, that sort of shapes the personality, not only of type three, but of all, of the, all three heart types. So this is just a sense of the foundation, the psychological and, and spiritual foundation of uh, the Enneagram. So how does the Enneagram work? Well, uh, the Enneagram uh, as a growth tool starts from the idea, and this is the personality tool side of it, uh, from the idea that uh, if you can have a map that highlights your key patterns associated with your core childhood survival strategy, um, you can learn about yourself and eventually um, uh, let go of this pattern of defense um, and be more of who you are. Um, it comes from the ancient Greek idea that the key to life, the key to know everything you can learn in life is know thyself. And of course, this is inscribed on the Temple of Delphi. Uh, this was the basis of knowledge in, in, in ancient Greece and a lot of esoteric or uh, mystical spiritual traditions will say uh, that we should study ourselves in the same way a scientist studies the outside world. So just like you would measure things in the outside world to learn about them, you need to be tuning in to yourself uh, to understand uh, yourself uh, and that this will also teach you about the world. So uh, the idea here is that we are asleep uh, it's a kind of an Eastern idea, and this is certainly a lot of what Gurdjieff said, is that we think that we're awake, but we're really kind of in a waking sleep. Uh, and so one of the things that we need to do is wake up, and the Enneagram is, if nothing else, a tool for awakening, uh, for helping you understand what you're doing every day and how you are caught up in, in patterns of behavior and thinking and feeling that you've been doing so long that are so familiar that they're completely invisible to you. Uh, and so the Enneagram's great strength is that it highlights these patterns that can guide self-observation so that you can learn about yourself. It's almost like a shortcut to learning about yourself. I always would say, you know, when people were in, in therapy to my clients, we use the Enneagram because it's going to save us a lot of time. You know, you could come in here and you could talk about what's going on with you and I could try to figure out how to help you. But if we can figure out where you land in the Enneagram, we can go right to the heart of the matter. It also helps us have empathy for others. One of the first things people always say when they learn the Enneagram and that there are these nine worldviews, these nine patterns, these nine ways of seeing the world. And Helen Palmer used to say, we see, it's like we see 360 degrees of reality through a narrow slice based on our focus of attention. Uh, when we learn that we have this specific focus of attention, but it's not the same as eight other kinds of people and they have different focuses of attention, uh, we have much more empathy for others. But we because we can see we're not having a conflict with this person because one of us is wrong or bad or anything like that. It's that we're coming from different angles on the topic. We're just seeing things completely differently. So it, and I use this a lot in couples counseling. Uh, it's a great way to comp all of a sudden understand why your partner is doing what they're doing and the fact that, and have empathy for their position and their feelings. So the ancient roots of the Enneagram, and I, I think we'll talk about this more uh, later, but so I'll just uh, say a few things about this. Um, we don't know the exact origins of the Enneagram. Uh, we believe it's probably thousands of years old. It probably came through Egypt, uh, through Pythagoras, who studied in, uh, in the Far East and also in Egypt. Uh, it may have come through Babylonia. Certainly we see signs of it in, in ancient Egypt, uh, in ancient Greece. 
Um, I'm going to focus for a moment uh, on Homer's Odyssey. Uh, but as you can see, it came it co in, in the modern era. It came, we know about the symbol through Gurdjieff, and it came through Oscar Chazo, who brought it forth in the late 60s, early 70s, Claudio Narano, who learned the system from Chazo and then developed it uh, a lot. And then, uh, of course, it leaked out from his group. Uh, but it's connected to, uh, I think, the perennial philosophy that exists uh, that, that tells us that at the basis of all the world's religion uh, is the same message. Uh, and that was one of the things that fascinated me about it. So I want to talk a little bit just about Homer's Odyssey. Uh, and that is that uh, Homer's Odyssey uh, is where we see, I think, pretty convincing evidence that the Enneagram is at least this old. Um, the, uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, of course, by Homer were two of the first books written down uh, in Western literature. Uh, and they um, told the story of the Trojan War and the Iliad and uh, Odysseus's journey home after the Trojan War. Now, Odysseus was the clever uh, Greek uh, warrior who had the idea of the Trojan horse. Um, now, after the Greeks win the Trojan War, he sets off on a journey home to Ithaca, uh, home to his wife and his kingdom. And uh, his journey home is the subject of the Odyssey. Uh, now, where this is thought by scholars to be a metaphorical journey home to the true self. So it's a story about how, coming home to who you truly are. Um, and... Uh, What's fascinating about the Odyssey is that in the middle section of the poem, uh, The Great Wanderings, where he tells the story of his journey home from the Trojan War, uh, he visits nine mythic lands and meets these mythic creatures where he's tested and he has to undergo trials in order to move forward. Well, what do you know? Uh, it turns out these nine lands turn out to match up with the Enneagram archetypes exactly. And he travels to them in order, um, starting with the lotus eaters at nine um, and going clockwise around the circle. Um, interestingly, the very center of the poem of the Odyssey, the very center, like the, if you, the, the, the line that's the center of the poem, where is he? He's in Hades in the underworld. Uh, and the underworld on the Enneagram symbol is, uh, is symbolized by the uh, break between five and four. Uh, and so he is at the middle of the poem uh, as, as he comes uh, there. So we have this very interesting, uh, very obvious parallel between the Enneagram and uh, the Odyssey. And of course, what's the, the, the myth, the, the story of the Odyssey is uh, is this journey home to the true self, but it's also this idea that we need to learn about ourselves in order to go forward. Uh, and uh, and it, it, was, it was thought to be, this is a story that had been told by traveling bards or storytellers for potentially hundreds of years. Um, first time is written down in the Odyssey. And it, so it, this, this myth was one of the uh, ways to bring forward uh, one of the big ideas about uh, what what life is all about. So the 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 journey, as we can see in that the journey metaphor, uh, the enneagram maps a fall from consciousness, um, and it's this both the both encoded in the biblical idea of the fall from consciousness, so the fall in the Garden of Eden, but also what Freud talked about about eighty percent of us is unconscious. Uh, that there is a kind of degradation of consciousness when we come into uh, human life. Uh, as we grow from, from a child, babies are thought to be very much in touch with their essential nature. Uh, but as we grow, we kind of fall out of that deeper connection. Uh, we, we fall more into unconsciousness and a kind of forgetting. Um, and so uh, one of the things I've done is connected up uh, the idea of journey with the hero's journey uh, and that the idea that there is an under, a conscious undertaking of a journey, departure, initiation, and return. Um, uh, but I won't go into too much of this now because uh, in the interest of time and moving on, but just to give you a flavor of uh, all that's encoded in the Enneagram. Uh, now, there's an acorn parable in my book 
Um, I was going to read it, but I don't think I will because I think uh, you can read it yourself. But uh, basically, the acorn parable that I quote in my book, The Complete Enneagram, um, I got from uh, Cynthia Bourgeau's book, The Wisdom Way of Knowing, which is a beautiful little book. Um, but she got it from Maurice Nichol, who was a follower of Gurdjieff. Um, and basically, uh, it's this story where there are this, there's this kingdom of acorns, and they sit at the foot of uh, this big oak tree, and they go about their business, um, polishing their shells and taking self-help courses about how to keep your shell shiny. Uh, and one day, this capless, dirty stranger kind of uh, drops out of the sky and says something kind of weird. He basically says, we are that, pointing up to the oak tree. And they think he's crazy. They don't know what he's talking about. They say, well, that's, that's nuts. We're acorns, not oak trees. And then one of them just decides, for the sake of argument, to engage him in conversation and says, well, how would we become that? And he says, well, it has something to do with going into the ground and having your shell crack open. So one of the most, <laughs> one of the most important things about the Enneagram is that it shows us our blind spots. It shows us our shadow. Um, and there's, um, and I think this is uh, why it's almost why I find it more effective than any other tool out there because it, you know, if if you believe in the idea that what Gurdjieff said it comes from objective knowledge, um, it shows us what we're not seeing. Um, we naturally resist seeing our shadow. It's the part of ourselves that we believe is unacceptable. Uh, but if we are going to become whole, if we are going to manifest our higher potential, if we are going to let go of that personality part of us that's whole purpose, whole reason for being is to defend us from those shadow elements and the ways we might feel about it, uh, we need to let go of our personality patterns. We need to become conscious of our shadow and integrate our blind spots. Um, and I love this quote from Naranjo. Um, he says that the, uh, that the problem with, with seeing and integrating our shadow is that we don't know what we don't know. Um, our blind spots are blind. Uh, and I love this quote from his, uh, his book, Character Neurosis, which is, is his you know, foundational, seminal integration of the Enneagram in psychology. He says, the fall from consciousness to unconsciousness is such that awareness comes to be blind in regard to its own blindness and limited to the point of believing itself free. That's my favorite quote from him. Um, and it's this idea that how are we to move forward and become more whole if we don't see what our work is, if we don't understand what we don't understand about ourselves, or we don't uh, see and accept uh, what we don't see. So um, I want to check in on time because you're I good. know. You're good. Yeah, we're good? Okay. Yeah. So here are, here are the different ways, in a nutshell, uh, we might use the Enneagram for personal growth. First of all is for self-observation, right? It's just you can read uh, in a good book about the Enneagram, here are the defensive patterns of, uh, of your particular type. Um, so it's a lot about self-awareness, just becoming aware, like every day saying, oh, there I go again. Um, noticing what you do. Now you have to do this with compassion, right? Because what you might start doing at first is, oh, I did it again. And, and you might be, get self-critical and angry at yourself. The key is to self-observe with compassion. Um, that just to say, oh, there, now I'm seeing it. Now I'm learning. It's a learning process. Um, uh, also integrating blind spots, learning about what you don't know. And of course, when you're working in a group, and, and Gurdjieff was famous for saying, alone one man can do nothing, that you can only really grow uh, in a group or community because you need other people helping you see your blind spots. So one of the things when I work with businesses or when I work with in my workshops um, is about uh, taking in feedback, right? Are you open enough to take in feedback from other people, or do you get defensive? This is a key element to know. Are you working on yourself, or, or do you just think you're working on yourself? So noting, noticing your blind spots, taking in uh, information from the outside about what you might not be seeing. Vice to virtue conversion is another piece. Um, this uh, refers to the vice or the passion. Each of the nine types is associated with a passion. 
uh, uh, sins, that, that seven deadly sins in the Christian tradition, plus uh, fear and deceit. Uh, and Richard Rohr says, interesting that the Catholics would leave out fear and deceit, uh, but it's uh, an interesting uh, path to go from the passion or the sin of the type, which is sort of the focus of the lower emotional center, and it's a key emotional motivation uh, that shapes the personality is the passion. Uh, and I'll say in a moment what that is for every type. Uh, but for me, for instance, it's pride. Um, and so pride is something that I really need to learn to be aware of if I'm using the Enneagram as a growth tool. Uh, it's very unconscious uh, when, I, when you first start working on yourself. Um, when I first learned the Enneagram and I learned I was a two, I didn't really understand what pride was at all. Pride's probably one of the trickiest of the passions because unlike fear, which we all tend to know, and anger, which is pretty straightforward, pride sounds like a good thing. Um, but it's actually, uh, uh, in Dante's sense, the worst sin of all, it's at the lowest pit of hell. Um, but what pride is, is it's just a need to see yourself as better than you are. A need to be important. Uh, a passion for self-elevation, for puffing yourself up. Uh, and so um, twos need to feel important. And so that's one of the things that they need to learn to self-observe. So when I first learned the Enneagram, I didn't get what pride was. I felt like I had low self-esteem, that I wasn't really self-elevating. Um, but when I really started to understand what it was, um, I saw it everywhere. And so that's part of the trick is to start seeing your passion everywhere. If you're a six, it's fear. Um, I'll just go forward for a second. If you're, if you're a one, it's anger. Uh, two is pride. Three is self-deceit, thinking, mistaking yourself for your image or your person or your persona. For four, it's envy, comparing yourself to others. Uh, for five, it's avarice, withholding. Um, and for, a, for six, it's fear. Seven is gluttony, uh, eight is lust, and nine is sloth. So these are central motivating factors. And of course, the Enneagram types are known not by their behaviors, because different types can do the same behaviors, but by their motivation and their focus of attention. So knowing what you're observing, your passion or your vice, and aiming for its opposite is one big way to use the Enneagram. Um, and then another big way to use the Enneagram is drawing on the inner dynamism or the movement of the symbol that I talked about at the beginning. And I'm using eight here in the graphic as an example. One is by using the types on either side of you, sometimes called wings. Um, I don't believe that wings are subtypes in and of themselves. So in other words, I don't think there's a thing called an eight with a seven wing where all eights with a seven wing look alike and have a share a specific set of traits. Um, I do think that we, are, we have greater access to our wing points, that they are um, influences, but I think it varies by person to person. Um, what those influences are, and more than anything else, I think that wing points, the types on either side, are developmental opportunities. They're ways of broadening your focus uh, in ways that are good places to start because you already have e e easier access to the types on either side of you. Also, the points that are connected to you within the diagram by these arrow lines are very important. Um, I'm doing whole workshops now with my teaching partner on how to use these wings for development. Uh, the types that are connected to your main type by these internal arrow lines are natural antidotes for your main type. So they're very important ways of creating balance and growing and stretching using the Enneagram map. So those are what we already talked about, very important. Um, so um, I'm almost done. Um, this is a poem that I love because I think it sums up perfectly um, how the Enneagram works. Um, so I'm going to read this. It's by Portia Nelson. It's called Autobiography in Five Short Chapters. Uh, and it, th here's how it goes. I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It's not my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I am in this same place. But it isn't my fault. 
it still takes a long time to get out. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit, but my eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. I walk down another street. So I think this, this, this sums up for me what, it, what my work with the Enneagram has been a little bit like. Um, and then I, I love this quote. Um, Ultimately, happiness comes down to choosing between the discomfort of becoming aware of your mental afflictions and the discomfort of being ruled by them. I love that. There's an Anais Nin quote that's a little bit like that, you know, something like the pain that it took to open the bud uh, is more than it took to stay closed in a, in a bud. Beautiful. So then this is just a little bit about what I'm doing today with the Enneagram. Um, I work with leaders and teams and organizations through the Chestnut Group, which is uh, a, an association I have with some friends and colleagues that also do organizational work. Um, I give international workshops uh, on the Enneagram, on the subtypes. Uh, I give a workshop now every year in Florence, Italy on uh, the Divine Comedy, Dante's Divine Comedy, and how it lines up with the Enneagram and how it deepens our understanding of the messages of the Enneagram. Um, and then I also do uh, workshops with my teaching partner, Aranio Pius, uh, we are forming a school this year uh, called the Chestnut Pious Enneagram Academy. That's the working title anyway. Um, and we offer workshops for professionals, uh, coaches and therapists. And how, if you're using the Enneagram, how to use it in the best possible way, how to understand the Enneagram at the deepest levels so that you can really use it well. Um, we're doing inner work retreats for personal growth for inner transformation. So we're calling the professional track workshops for outer impact. Uh, and uh, inner work retreats for personal growth and inner transformation. And we, Arani and I are believed that the Enneagram's purpose in this world is to help people do the deepest kind of inner work. Uh, and we're really dedicated to providing a space in which people can really understand themselves at a deep level and transform and, uh, and, and let go of the limiting patterns of their personality so they can be all of who they really are. Um, and we're offering certification programs in those. And more than anything else, we want to build the community of people who are doing this kind of work because uh, we think it, we can't do it alone, uh, and which I think is so much in the spirit of Commonweal. And uh, so providing a, a community of people who are <clears throat> dedicated to doing this kind of work with the Enneagram. And just to sum up, um, the Enneagram map helps us to know ourselves fundamentally uh, as we truly are. Uh, the false self of the personality is really a pathway back to the true self, to a remembrance of the true self. Um, and it helps us have more understanding for and compassion for others. And of course, this is something that's so needed in our world today. Uh, but having more empathy for what other people's uh, worldview is, what their pain is, what, what motivates them. Um, it helps us make our unconscious patterns conscious. And of course, this is one of the big functions of psychotherapy and psychology, um, so that we can grow beyond habitual limiting patterns that we adopt in, in childhood that we often don't know we have. Um, and it helps us manifest our higher potential. It helps us be, as I say in my, in my book, our oak tree self, uh, as opposed to staying uh, bound up in our acorn self. Uh, helps us let go of uh, survival mode and defensiveness and open up to, uh, to, to being you know, the best person that we truly are, that we really already are, that we just need to kind of unveil. Thank you. Yeah. And I just want to thank you for all the years that you've put into this. So, so profound. Thank you. Yeah. There's so many places I could start, but um, because your work is based so deeply on Ichazo and Naranjo, 
Uh, I forget whether you knew Ichazo. Did you take, did you ever meet him? Or? No, I've never met yeah. him. I've taken just a couple of courses in the Eureka School yeah. that he started. So I've trained with a few of his teachers, but very little. Mm-hmm. Naranjo is still alive. Yeah? Right. Living in Berkeley, I believe. Yeah. 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 And I've watched some of his more recent uh, videos. Mm-hmm. Um, he's older. Um, but um, when... You you were part of his uh, SAT program pro, uh, meetings. I've done three of his SAT workshops, SAT okay. trainings, yeah, SAT retreats, yeah. When did you do those? Um, I did one in 2014, one in 2016, and one in 2017. So he continues to do them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, sometimes they happen without him there with his mm-hmm. teachers, and sometimes he's there. Mm-hmm. Um, less and less he's there, and often they'll say, oh, this is the last one he's doing, but then he feels well enough to do another one. Mm. Yeah. How would you give us a portrait of, a, a kind of a brief depth portrait of who this man, Claudio Naranjo, actually is? Mm. Well, as I don't, I don't claim to know him you know, I'm not. Specific, I'm not sort of one of his longtime students, so I want to be clear about that. Um, I am, especially as an academic, I think I uh, admire him because I, I, I so appreciate what he did in bringing the Enneagram forward, and it almost seems like it took someone like him who had such a a broad uh, depth of knowledge about so many things. Mm-hmm. Uh, to bring something like the Enneagram forward. Um, I think Echazo had that too, um, but, I, I, you know, Claudio had was an American-trained uh, psychiatrist uh, from Chile, um, someone who had been very interested in the spiritual, you know, since he was young. Um, and I think when he, uh, when he learned Echazo's system, um, he was able to develop it in a way that maybe no one else could have. Uh, I think he's, uh, you know, incredibly brilliant, uh, really, you know, was part of the human potential movement, uh, was very equally dedicated to spiritual work and psychological work. Uh, and really, I think a lot of his mission is confronting the ego. Uh, and so... I think part of what I did in my book was translating him a bit. Um, He is not someone who thinks too much about prettying up the language to make people feel good. uh, Because as uh, I've heard him say, you know, the personality, what we're talking about, we're talking about the Enneagram types, this is an ego game. Uh, and so he, I think, uh, bristles when people want to make it sound good. Uh, and it's funny, when I was writing my book, a lot of people I would run into would say things like, well, make sure you talk about the strengths. <laughs> um, and, and, and I do talk about the strengths, partly because if you don't, people close down pretty fast. Um, but he's not someone to, uh, to, to need to use language that will make people feel good. Um, And he also comes out of more of a psychoanalytic tradition uh, where you're using the words that you use aren't always very nice sounding. (laughs) You know, schizoid, you know, borderline. These are words that people, you know, narcissistic that people necessarily, I mean, understandably have reactions to. Um, But I think that he has just such a deep knowledge in so many different areas um, you know, so he talks about music, great composers and what their Enneagram types were. He's even played at conferences, played music of the different composers and talked about how the music reflected their type. He talks about philosophers and what their Enneagram types were and how to understand the types through their work. Um, so it, it, it's a, it, he's, a, he's someone who is very... Um, very focused on the, the knowledge and on using it to really help people uh, see themselves in, in, in a direct way. Hmm. He comes from an interesting family. Do you, my memory is uh, from Santiago, I believe. And I believe his mother um, held um, 
set of gatherings for interesting people that were quite well known. Do you know this story? I don't know this story, no. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've got this right. Um, I think it's a Jewish family. I'm not 100% sure of that. Do you know that? I don't. Okay. But I do know his mother held gatherings, uh, sort of, what do you call them? Um, Salons. 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 Salons, right. Yeah. He has held salons. Mm -hmm. And he was actually very deeply involved with music himself. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he comes from a, a very interesting background. And, and for me, reading him, which I do, as I said, the depth and breadth of his frame of cultural reference far exceeds most American psychologists. Definitely. Far exceeds. Definitely. And therefore, and, and we forget that the Latin American intelligentsia was so deeply connected with Europe right. and therefore inherits the European tradition, yeah. which we're somewhat cut off from. Right. So, you know, it's interesting that you say that it, it hasn't, Enneagram hasn't gotten the respect it deserves because it doesn't have the academic base, and I get that, the, you know, the measurement base and so on. But I would say, in addition to that, that... Um, that we don't remember what European cultural history has done for uh, depth psychology. Right. We don't remember that in a very real sense that Carl Jung's great contribution was that he took the entire lineage that came down to him. You know, he used to say that he thought he was a, you know, a, that his grandmother had had an affair with Goethe. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> know. You know, know. Uh, and that he was actually a linear a descendant of Goethe. But he <laughs> he brings in you know Goethe and the whole romantic movement and yes. all of the stuff which got erased um, by rationalism and so on and so forth. That's right. And and then it comes over here diluted. Right. And and never gets as much traction as Freud did and so on. Exactly, yeah, the American psychological tradition is so much more positivist. It's, it's positivist. so much more based on the scientific model. And empiricist. And less than uh, um, sort of humanities. And right. you know, there's a great book that I love by Bruno Bettelheim called Freud and Man's Soul. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, that's why I, I, I'm often always at the ready with, you know, Freud said that psychotherapy is a cure through love. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that you're right, that in Europe, uh, it, the, there's such a depth to these intellectual traditions that isn't mm -hmm. just based on science. Uh, science is an important part of it, of course, uh, but it's complemented by mm -hmm. uh, different strands and, 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 and these different, you know, ways of thinking. So... Um, so I think you, you're really right to point to that, that there is a way that it's almost like the depth of the European tradition, and, and as Claudio expresses it, it almost didn't come through. Mm -hmm. Can you flip over to the slide that shows us the uh, lineage going back to Pythagoras and so forth? Because to me, that slide, in a certain sense, says it all. Yeah, there we go. So the slide shows us starting with Homer's Odyssey, Pythagoras, Plato, Plotinus, the Neoplatonists, and then branching out to the Jewish mystics Philo and the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, the Christian Desert Fathers of Vagrius, who I don't know, Ramon Lul, who I don't know, uh, the Sufi orders Al-Ghazali and the Naqshbandi order of the Sufis. Remind me of who Vagrius was. Vagrius was a, a, what we call a Christian contemplative around 300 A.D., okay. living in Egypt. Um, he had started off, I think, uh, in Turkey or thereabout. Uh, he, he, was, he had started off as part of the court, but he had sort of retreated from uh, life as a sort of an elite to become a, one of the Christian desert, desert, desert fathers, which were basically these people who retired to the desert to... Mm -hmm meditate, to pray, to contemplate. And he came forward with uh, eight thoughts that get in the way of meditation. So when you're meditating, you know, here, here are what the eight things that kind of get in the way of between me and God. Uh, and what do you know, they match up with the Enneagram uh, types, with the passions of the types. Uh, so that's another piece of, infer sort of another sort of touch point of 
uh, potential evidence that the Enneagram um, goes back. And, and we don't know exactly whether he, we don't think he invented them. We think he was getting them from a deeper mystical tradition. And a lot of his writings and his contemporaries who wrote um, along similar lines were burned as heresy around that time because, of course, the church hierarchy didn't want the message out there that you can, um, you know, connect with spirit or with the divine in a direct way. And these were sort And of interestingly, evidence. the Catholic Church uh, still strikes back against the Enneagram, yeah. even though Richard Rohr literally wrote the book on right. uh, the Enneagram for Christian traditions. Um, yeah, yeah. Not, I think I would say more the upper hierarchy. Yes, right. You know, my aunt, my aunt is a my great aunt is yeah. a Catholic nun, right. and she's always saying, "When will you come talk to the nuns?" Yeah. Uh, and they all know the Enneagram, and they all yeah. use it and like it. So, so yeah. Rohr has a great line. I'm an Enneagram five, and Rohr has a great line in his book. You know, the Enneagram five is the observer and sort of the the most isolated point on the Enneagram. And Rohr has a great line in his book. He's, he's teaching Enneagram in a monastery, and, and you know, he comments that the fives always want the rooms at the end of the hall, and they want to be by themselves and all this. And he said that uh, before he understood Enneagram, he used to look up to them because they were so, you know, reserved and contemplative and all this. <laughs> He said, but then he realized they were just fives. And, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they don't have some special spiritual <laughs> right. gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us who Ramon Lull is. Yeah, so this is this is sort of, Ramon Lull is on my to-do list of someone to study much more in depth. So far, I've collected a lot of books, but haven't delved too deeply. He was basically based in Spain uh, around the 1300. Um, and there was kind of this resurgence of um, some ancient wisdom that we think might be connected to the Enneagram in the, like, kind of right before the Renaissance. Um, this is what may have come through to Dante, for instance. Um, Ramon Lull was in it. And he kind of, and in his work, we see different diagrams um, that look a lot like the Enneagram. Um, so he, and he was bringing together different traditions. In Spain, he was influenced by the Jewish tradition. He was influenced, he was uh, 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 clergy and the church, uh, but he was interested. He was interested in different strains that were alive in Spain, and he was kind of trying to integrate different uh, mystical traditions. And uh, actually, you find the enneagram in his writings. Mm -hmm. Why, in your chart, does the Kabbalistic tree of life come after Philo and the Jewish mystics? I, th I always think of it as very ancient. You know this. This I didn't originate this chart. Oh, okay. I, will, I will say that, so yeah. I'm not sure about that. Um, okay. I'm not sure where Philo fits in there, but I do know that the, the Kabbalah matches up yeah. with the Enneagram as well. Per perfectly, yeah. yeah. And let's the Sufi orders, Al Ghazali and the Naqshbandi order. Uh, I I I know there's a tradition that you see it in the Sufi tradition. Right. But how much do we know about Enneagram like structures in the Sufi tradition? Well, um, Gurdjieff, ref when Gurdjieff never said exactly where right. he got his knowledge, yeah. he references esoteric Christianity and he also references Sufism. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't say this directly came from there. Um, uh, Ma I know that uh, the Sufis teach the Enneagram quite a bit. Um, part of it's related to um, uh, the whirling tradition, the dervish mm -hmm. tradition, uh, but the Naqshbandi order was known as an order that um, taught about the Enneagram. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is a book that I am, a friend of mine is helping me translate in from Spanish to English uh, called the Sufi Enneagram. Uh -huh. And it's written by Abdul Karim Budino, who is a Sufi teacher in Argentina. Um, and it's quite powerful in terms of how to use the Enneagram mm -hmm. in, in ways that I haven't heard described quite that way before. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a way that the Sufis uh, developed uh, uh, different understandings of the map. Uh, and as I said, my, um, my teaching partner has studied extensively in Sufism, and so some of what he talks about is drawn from the mm -hmm. Sufis in terms of understanding uh, what the spiritual meaning of the Enneagram map as process is. One other thing that's fascinated me about Enneagram for a long time is that 
the resonances to psychosynthesis and to um, the ancient uh, Greek and Hindu um, systems of gods. So, for example, uh, the Greeks, uh, when somebody had a problem that they were dealing with, psychological or whatever, they felt that they this person was under the influence of one of the gods. Mm. And so they would try to figure out which god they needed to worship to. And so right. you had, you know, you had uh, the system of gods, which were analogous, let us say, to the personality types. Uh, likewise, um, uh, you could say that to some degree of the Hindus, but the Greeks were more obvious. And obviously the Greeks were the ones that influenced Jung and Hillman and so on. Mm -hmm. So then you have in uh, Asajoli's psychosynthesis, you have all the various subpersonalities uh, in the unconscious conscious and the right. superconscious. Right. Um, and it's like that except Asajoli doesn't give you the information of the nine types. They're essentially blank. Right, know. right, right. That that reminds me, Essie Jolie's work reminds me of what Gurdjieff used to talk a lot about how the many eyes. Right. Um, that we have many voices inside ourselves contending for, you know, now we want this and now we want that. And, and personal growth work is necessarily about, you know, kind of alchemically bringing together mm -hmm. the eye into one. Uh, I yeah so I said Jolie's work always reminds me of that if and voice dialogue work which some people have mm -hmm. done it's it, there's a way of if you can identify the different voices and become more aware of them you can not have so many contending mm -hmm. voices has anybody ever looked at Joseph Campbell's work on myth which and and Jung and asked whether uh, the the global archetypes that uh, Jung and Campbell in different ways found in myth uh, array in any relationship to Enneagram? I don't think anyone's done that. Mm -hmm. um, I just uh, We just did a, a keynote speech at the European Enneagram Conference in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and, we, and the theme of the conference was the wisdom of the true self. Uh, and so we did a whole uh, talk on the journey of the true self mapped mm -hmm. in the Enneagram, and we drew on Jung and, and the idea of individuation. So that was more about process. Uh, and also Jung's idea of the monomyth. So we more looked at it in terms of process as opposed to archetypes. Um, Jung's archetypes are interesting because you have more like the mother, you know, the mother archetype or the anima and the animus mm -hmm. and things like that, which I, aren't exactly uh, the same kind of archetypes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's probably work to be done in there. Mm -hmm. I've also heard recently a woman from Australia was telling me that there are if you look in the Mayan religion, there are at, the, at this one sort of part of their teaching, there are these nine gods. Mm -hmm. um, I just there was a guy I just heard give a talk uh, from Egypt about the nine names of gods in the mm -hmm. Sufi religion and how there are certain names of God that are that that are that match up perfectly with these any kind of like what mm -hmm. you were saying. Uh, we can be over identified with one of these ways of being, and we need to go to the high side of that name of God. You mentioned that uh, that Rohr points out that in Christianity, uh, the seven deadly sins missed, what were the two? Fear and deceit. Fear yes. and deceit. He makes that joke, which I right. like. But, I mean, Having point grown is up as a Catholic myself. They yeah. lost two along the way. Yeah, um, hmm, I wonder why fear, yeah, and, fear and deceit got left out. But yeah. <laughs> interestingly, in the diagnostic psychiatric manual, uh, People say that the one that's missing is the Enneagram 3. That's right. And that it's missing because uh, the United States is an achiever yeah. It's a three uh, country. culture, yes. and therefore yes. we don't regard... We don't regard that as... As abnormal. As abnormal. Or, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. Naranjo was the one that mapped Enneagram onto the diagnostic psychiatric system. Right, right. Like he took what he got from Echazo and he, right. he put it in, in more uh, psychological language and drew some of these, um, right. these different connections. And it's not perfect, but there's a broad general yeah, connection. Yeah, yeah. So what I get from this is that in the Abra all three of the Abrahamic faiths out of Jerusalem and the uh, tradition out of Athens, 
that both Jerusalem and Athens have either independently or, or woven together found the same nine personality or, or archetypal personalities for thousands of years. Yeah. For thousands of years. And since Naranjo points out that the, uh, the highest intention of any theory of psychology is a, is a theory of character type, mm -hmm. uh, and different people create all different kinds of character type structures, here we have one that's been stable in the West for thousands of years. Right. So why doesn't it get some respect? <laughs> That is a great question. Why doesn't it get yeah. respect? Yeah. That's, I think that's, that's totally question. fascinating. It is fascinating. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's shifting. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. I think it's, it's shifting, yeah. but I, it's, I think it's a little bit like, um, you know, I studied at California Institute of Integral Studies, and we have a, a great archetypal astrologer there, Rick Tarnas. Yeah. And he, he, you know, wrote his book about Western civilization, and his big thing is about how 2,000 years ago, science and spirituality came apart. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've been a part of her since, but they, they're kind of coming back together. Mm -hmm. And I wonder sometimes if that's part of it, because you even have people in the Enneagram community who are more scientifically inclined, who don't believe the Enneagram has ancient roots. Yes, right. So I think there, I think there is a way that um, it has to do with uh, maybe not understanding kind of what you're putting your finger on here about how there is this tradition that's been around for thousands of years. It's taken different shapes and it's come out in different forms, uh, but it's now kind of hopefully more and more coming together and, and, and being br brought out. But I think, I think that's a great question why it doesn't get more respect. And I think people are sensitive, I think especially in the US to things that are too woo woo, too new age. Um, I've had people tell me, okay, but you need to call it something else or you need to not use the symbol. And it's like, well, what would, what would, why would I do that? You know, mm -hmm. um, but there has been, there have been people who thought, well, this isn't gonna get anywhere because it looks like, you know, something scary. What was the intention of keeping the teaching secret? I think for, I think certainly, at least what I've read is, the reason was um, it needed to be passed on from master to student in a controlled environment uh, because of the sensitivity and the depth and the power of the knowledge. Um, and that, in other words, if you kind of let it out to people who aren't ready for it, who aren't in a safe container, either, Gurdjieff used to say, either it doesn't do anything or it can do damage. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was one thing, was the idea that people aren't really ready for this, people won't really understand it, people will misuse it. Um, I think that may be shifting now. Um, and I've heard Naranjo say that while he didn't like the way the Enneagram got disseminated. At the end of talking a lot about that, he'll say, and maybe there is a purpose to it getting out there. Um, so I do think that it's a mark of uh, evolution uh, that it has gotten out there more. And when I was writing my um, the book about leadership, you know, I kept thinking of it as the Myers-Briggs of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. It's like, and I just, I read, I just heard someone speaking on YouTube the other night, and he was saying that the reason why businesses like the Myers-Briggs so much is that it doesn't offend anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's true, you know, not to say it doesn't have uses, but it doesn't offend anyone. And I think the Enneagram types, there is this sense when you find your type because it's so right on, because it shows you your blind spots, there is a way that it's it's kind of, it can be kind of disturbing or upsetting, or it's what a friend of mine calls the ick factor um, <laughs> that we warn people about. Um, like you may, this may not feel good when you really read the truth about yourself at first. Um, and so I think that's that's part of it. Myers Briggs, of course, comes out of the Jungian tradition. Right. And people have tried to map Myers Briggs and Enneagram. It doesn't work out really well. Does yeah, it? there isn't really a direct correspondence. I'm starting to have conversations with. There's some people at a, a, a organization called Personality Hacker, and they're they're using the Myers Briggs, I think, in some really great ways. They're really point. They're trying to use it more more effectively as a real growth tool as opposed to just naming differences. One big difference, and I think why it's hard to line them up completely, is that the 
Myers-Briggs types and Jung talks only about cognitive functioning. Um, it's just about the head level, whereas the Enneagram talks about the head, the heart, and the body. And so the types are these very interesting combinations of head patterns and heart patterns and body-based or behavior action patterns, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of why it can be difficult to, to sort of draw real correlations with the, with the Myers-Briggs types. You have three beautiful blog posts up on your website, uh, and one of them is about taking the Enneagram seriously. A second uh, is about coaching, using it in coaching and therapy. And the third is about um, uh, do people really use the Enneagram to grow? Mm. And, and all three of them are very worth uh, reading. Um, but the one about do people really use the Enneagram to grow, I think that's really striking because I know for myself that I can, I mean, one of the things about being an Enneagram 5, at least they say, but it certainly seems to me true, is that a lot of other points on the Enneagram, people have a fairly high ick factor about it. <laughs> but the five can actually be quite satisfied That's with true. being a five. I mean, That's true. Yeah. You know, what's wrong off, with this? What's wrong with that? Right. And it's so, working for me. <laughs> it's working for me, right. Yeah. I mean, Oren Slotsberg, who I've worked with our executive director for, for, for four years, and after a year or so of working with me, he turned to me and said, I notice you don't stress much. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true because detachment is my middle name, you right. know, and uh, also because um, I lead with the mind and not with emotion. So emotion isn't there to get in the way right. very much. And right. so, yeah. you know, I'm able to do stuff without, um, without too much stress a lot of the time. Yeah. But therefore, perhaps, perhaps particularly for me, but I think it's true for all, it's quite easy to say to yourself, you recognize what you're doing and you say, yeah, but that's because I'm a five, you know? Right. And so, or I'm a three or I'm a seven or I'm eight. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily engage you in the real purpose of the Enneagram, which is as a guide to the hard work to overcoming the personality right. and finding your true self. Yeah. And I think that's a really vital point about this, that, you know, that, that that's what it's really all about. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, some people just get to the point of description and say, well, I'm doing this because of that, you mm -hmm. know, which is, you know, that's self-understanding. But I, I do think the real purpose of it is to go beyond that, is to mm -hmm. really say, here's what I tend to focus on. Here's how I'm potentially limiting myself. Here's what I'm not seeing and, and use that as information um, to to expand. Mm -hmm. I find it much easier. So, for example, my wife is a four, mm -hmm. uh, which is, as you said, the individualist. Or We have quite a number of fours here. Jennifer Stoll's a four. Mm -hmm. Kira Epstein's a four. We have quite a number of fours around Commonweal. We have some ones um, and uh, sevens and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find that it's very helpful to me in compassionate understanding of, of both myself and other people, mm -hmm. even if I'm not driven to grow mm -hmm. initially or need to work on that more. I love your point about how uh, uh, self-observation never becomes habitual. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that, that, you know, coming back to that. But I find it, a number of the rest of us find it useful in compassionately understanding each other as we work together, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And in a marriage, it's unbelievably helpful, you know? Oh, yeah. I've heard uh, a lot of people yeah. say the Enneagram saved their marriage. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or any kind of deep relationship. <laughs> Including Annika's husband. <laughs> yeah. In any kind of deep relationship. I yeah. mean, you know, the two and the four are the most emotionally attached. The five is the most, uh, you know, isolated. So my wife you know, wants attachment, and I'm sitting back in my study reading or something. Right. You know, so so that there's that, but understanding each other yes. comes deeply into yeah. the picture. 
Yeah, I heard one of the greatest stories I ever heard of five tell on a Enneagram panel, you know, mm-hmm. people people of one type talk about themselves. It was a five and he was he was trying to get across the idea of how he relates to his emotions. And he said his ex-wife was a four. Mm-hmm. And he said, here's the problem in our marriage in a nutshell. He said, if emotions were money, mm-hmm. she would be a millionaire and I would have a few pennies. Exactly. And she always wanted more from me. And I would mm-hmm. give her like... 12 of my 16 pennies Mm -hmm. and she would think that was nothing and to me that was a lot but fortunately or unfortunately uh, the top of my stack of self-preservation sexual and social is either social or sexual they're close and so the sexual five is the one with the most emotional access right so fortunately, I have more pennies in my. You know, <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I have that'll more do well capacity for, to yeah. do that. Yeah. Uh, and then the social. So, I mean, so the sexual is, as you say, the one to one. It's the, you know, the. <coughs> I don't like groups unless I'm doing something intentional, like mm. the new school, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, or unless I'm working, but um, the, the my two strengths are the one to one. Mm-hmm. And then the social, which is the new school. Yep. And it's, it's you know, there it's it called is. totem, right? Yep. And so what you seek out is extraordinary people, and then you want to be in one-to-one dialogue That's with right. them. You know? and, That's right. That's uh, right. Yeah. You want so, to create community based on yeah. common interests. Exactly. And, and, exactly. and bring people together yeah. around those things. So yeah. we could do this with every point, but I'm just drawing on, you know, my direct personal experience. Um, yeah. So... Uh, You've taught all over the world. Um, what are the cultural differences between how Enneagram is held and understood in Europe and the United States and Latin America? What are, what are the cultural mm-hmm. uh, shifts? I mean, where is it most respected and seen most deeply, if you can speak to that, or just how is it held in different sure. places? Sure, yeah, it's very interesting, the countries where... And there's a lot of Enneagram or where mm-hmm. it's really well respected or you have a really alive mm-hmm. community. Um, I mean, the interest one, the first thing to be said about the Enneagram uh, culturally, internationally, is that it's the same no matter where you go to right. an extent. The types, you know, a, a five or a six or an eight is the same no matter what country you're in for the most part. Mm-hmm. However, there are cultural overlays. Um, I would say there's a lot of Enneagram in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's an, an organization in Argentina. Uh, there's in Europe, uh, I would say, interestingly, in the Scandinavian countries, there's a lot of Enneagram. In Denmark has a really big community. Um, Finland and Denmark probably mainly in Sweden and now a growing one in Norway. Um, there's some in Italy. Uh, interestingly, in Germany, there's Enneagram, but they don't interact with the international community. They don't come to conferences. Hmm. Um, I've heard Germans say that and I have a big connection to Germany because my brother lives there. Um, but I've heard Germans say that, that, that one reason for that may be that when they come together, they want to speak their own language. Hmm. Um, and also, I had a friend who is actually Austrian from Vienna. She went to an Enneagram conference in Germany, and she said it was very interesting. They were congratulating themselves for all getting together, but there were basically three groups that didn't interact with each other. <laughs> um, so it's, I think in some ways there's politics that gets in the way of expanding Enneagram communities. Um, but where else? I know about Denmark. Um, what about Asia? Netherlands. In Asia, there's a lot of Enneagram. It's very big in China. Uh-huh. Uh, and it's really come up through the coaching community. It's mm-hmm. got tied together with coaching, and coaching is really big in China. And so the Enneagram is its even in universities in China. Um, in Korea, so the only the only two languages that my that the complete Enneagram has been translated into right now are Korean and Thai. Interesting. Oh, interesting. So there's a Thai version and a Korean version. And the Korea has a very nice community. Again, there's politics. There are a few different groups there. Um, but they have, you know, I went there a couple of years ago and did a two day workshop and we had 150 people there, uh, which was big. Um, there's some in Japan, there's some in Singapore. I've gotten emails from a guy in India recently and in Pakistan. Um, so, but it's also here true, there. isn't it? That at least people say that different cultures can be 
terms of national character type to bit. Yes. So Germany is considered a six culture. Social six. Right. And the United States is a three culture. Right. What are some of the other cultures that map? So Brazil is a seven culture. Okay. You see that with their soccer yeah. team, and yeah. I think they're playing right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Don't tell me who won. Right. Um, and... Uh, France, I believe, is a four, mm -hmm. maybe even a sexual four country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, my Brazilian friend now lives in the UK. Um, and it, it's interesting, in the UK and Australia, there's some Enneagram, but it hasn't been really grown up, especially mm -hmm. because it's not accepted in business. Mm -hmm. um, but in the UK, uh, my friend says he thinks it's either a one or a five culture, mm -hmm. probably five. Um, and what else? Who you else can, to some degree, also type religions to different points, right? Generally, in a loose way, I think of like Buddhism as a five religion. Right. Christianity is a heart type, potentially a two. two. Yeah, right. Uh, same with Sufism as being the mystical branch of Islam. Islam itself being more of an eight religion. I thought Sufism was supposed to be a nine. So but you said it's very heart based. It's very heart based. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But Islam itself is probably yeah. more eight. You right. Know? But the Asian countries very deferential. Do, uh, do they type to uh, a place on the enneagram? Um, I, d I don't know well enough. I've heard different things. Okay. Like I've, interestingly, I've heard China is a three country. Uh huh. Uh, that's what they type yeah. themselves as. Yeah. Probably not the same subtype as the right. U.S., which yeah. I think is probably social three. Mm -hmm. um, I think Japan, I mean, they say it's a shame culture. It feels maybe like four or five. Mm -hmm. um, Korea, I was just asking my Korean friends, um, and I can't remember what they've said. I've heard three and four. Mm -hmm. um, uh Argentina is said to be either four or two, social two or sexual four. The tango is a sexual four dance. So the people who um, love Enneagram, five certainly love it. Yeah. But what are the other Enneagram types that are drawn? <laughs> drawn to it. Yeah. Well, I, I, find, I find that fours and twos come to it a lot, mm. partly because they're motivated to understand relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, like, I probably, when I was more practicing as a psychotherapist, I probably had the most fours and twos mm -hmm. of all my clients. Mm -hmm. Fives like it because of the intellectual mm -hmm. um, interest of it. Um, I, th I find that sixes often first have a have a Stand reaction up, yeah. against it, but mm -hmm. when sixes get into it, they can really like it. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that you usually don't see as much as at, at um, Enneagram workshops are like eights and threes. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, their defense defensive mode is rewarded in our culture, especially in the mm -hmm. U.S. and in that three culture, mm -hmm. um, getting results. No, my experience is the threes I'm close to don't want to have anything to do with Enneagram. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I do have several, I mean, I've been yeah. around the Enneagram for a long time now. I have several friends who yeah. are threes yeah. that are deeply into the Enneagram. Yeah. 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 So as we close the morning uh, session, I'd like to come back to your acorn metaphor, mm -hmm. which your friend got from Gurdjieff, you said, I um, think. Chris, uh, oh. Cynthia Bergeau got from a follower of Gurdjieff. Yeah, right. It's a parable. And I believe Parker Gurdjieff. Palmer also uses the acorn. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's such yeah. a lovely metaphor, you know, that we're designed to grow into these trees, and here we are, these little things. Yeah. But as you said in that in that story, that the, that the dirty, funky Enneagram, <laughs> I mean, acorn, <laughs> says to the shiny ones, I think it has something to do with getting buried in the dirt and breaking open, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lovely, um, there's a lovely Jewish mystical story that um, someone asked uh, a rabbi why it was that the Torah said that uh, the words of Torah were written on the heart and not in the heart. Mm -hmm. And the rabbi responded that that was because uh, you had to wait till the heart broke open for the Enneagram, for the, you know, the Torah to truly enter. And uh, so it's that need, if we're going to awaken, to be broken open, yeah. to be deeply broken open. Right. Which actually leads me to the last thing I'll ask you. You, you 
teared up when you spoke of, uh, is it David Daniel's son? son? Yeah. Was he a boyfriend or simply a friend? He was not a boyfriend. He was a very, very good friend, like a best friend. Mm. Yeah. And had been since age 13, you know, 13 to 25 when he died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did he die? Under mysterious circumstances in New York City in the subway. Mm. No one really knows what happened. And he mm. was a, a, an incredible guy um, uh, on his way to be, he, was, he worked in New York City as a uh, investment banker. Mm. He was about to move to London and the Friday night before he was out with friends and went into the subway to take it home and no one knows what happened. Mm. That was very tragic. But they found his body. They found his body, oh. yeah. Mm. yeah. So is there some sense of destiny that you have that it was through your deep friendship with him that this emerged in your life? There is that, that aspect to mm -hmm. it. You know, it's, it's almost like when something like that happens, it's hard to find a reason for it, mm -hmm. you know? And it, I think it's, I've always, the thing that's come to me is that idea of like something beautiful grows out of destruction. And so mm -hmm. it, it, did have, it did have that mm -hmm. feeling to it. Like mm -hmm. I was brought towards something and I always joke I went into the family business mm -hmm. uh, because his kids are also involved in psychology, uh, his surviving children. And so, yeah, there is that element to it that his friendship led me there. And his father died in the last few years, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, he just died last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was how you were introduced yes. to any grand. Yeah, and an incredible yeah. teacher. An mm -hmm. incredible teacher. Taught at Stanford. Uh, taught at Stanford, yeah. And watching him interview people on Enneagram panels is what made me want to become a therapist. You know, what was, was he like? Inspiring. Oh, he was lovely. He was a self-preservation six, very warm. And mm -hmm. the name of self-preservation six is warmth. Warm, gentle, funny. Mm -hmm. um, he had a beautiful way of both supporting people, but then kind of like putting his finger on exactly the thing they needed to kind of look at or, mm -hmm. or question or understand. He would just pose a question that would be sort of a little bit impish and, and mischievous, uh, but really wise. Uh, and, you know, he saw the Enneagram as his calling, as his life's work, and uh, really dedicated himself to it completely, which, you know, for a Stanford psychiatrist to come to something like the Enneagram in the late 80s was, was a big deal. And I think he really helped it uh, legitimate it in many ways by the, how deeply he believed in it. He said it was by far the most helpful tool, the most powerful tool he'd ever come across. And how... After his death, is anybody continuing it at Stanford? You know, it hasn't been at Stanford for a while. Uh -huh. A little bit here and there. A friend of mine was teaching in, like, the adult education program. Uh -huh. uh, but it hasn't been around Stanford in, a, in the same kind of way in many, many years. So, again, unlike Jungian or Freudian, it hasn't achieved that level of right. academic uh, credibility. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. And that's just fascinating. Yeah. I mean, here's this amazing tool yeah. that um, used in business, you know, widely used in the certain areas of the culture, used in divinity schools, deeply in the Catholic tradition, um, and, and yet. And, yeah. and you know what? Maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah maybe that's yeah. the way it's supposed to be. Maybe that's supposed yeah. how it's supposed to be. <laughs> Well, thank you for this morning, and we will continue this afternoon. Thank you.